My first question then is, uh, you've been called the, the Walter Cronkite of BC Radio, the best there was, is, and ever will be. Uh, first question, what goes through your mind when you hear praise like that? Well, I'm a little bit embarrassed. I'm humiliated because to put me in the same category as Walter Cronkite is just not it. I think that quote came from uh, a good friend of mine at the Pace Group, um, uh, Norman Stowe, who told a lot of people during my retirement, early retirement years, that I was the most trusted man in British Columbia in terms of reporting, and he compared me to the Walter Cronkite of, of British Columbia. But it's a bit much. Now, uh, so many people have looked up to you, continue to look up to you, even even twenty, de- 20 decades, two decades after your t- your retirement. Who have you admired? Who do you admire? Uh, Warren Barker would be number one. He was my boss, and he uh, did a lot for me. He put me out uh, as an investigative reporter, which meant that I didn't have to be on any particular assignment, and it just made the world a difference so that I had the time to go and look at different things and, you know, spend quite a bit of time on one project. Some of my projects uh, I spent a lot of time on fizzled out. And this didn't amount to anything, but he, he never questioned what I was doing. Uh, never asked me, uh, how come you haven't had a story? He just gave me complete trust, which was really wonderful. Now, uh, let's go back to the beginning a bit. Uh, where do you think your curiosity uh, comes from? <laughs> from just being a kid, I think, uh, on the farm. I always wanted to know everything about uh, just about everything I looked at. And uh, the one incident was the old farmer fixing his farm equipment in the front yard. And his uh, housekeeper was my aunt. And I was staying there for a few days. And I asked so many questions. He called his uh, housekeeper and he said, Lucille, get this kid out of here. He asked too many questions. And uh, that same uh, aunt of mine did say that, I guess I talked a lot. She said, I think you're going to be a preacher, a preacher because you talk so much. <laughs> okay, uh, fair <laughs> enough. Um, now, you started uh, at NW back in its early days as a mom-and-pop type operation back when it was in New Westminster. Your history spans all the way to Chorus and the move to the Black Tower. Um, it's it's an achievement that will never be replicated, but I, I have to ask anyway, how do you manage to spend uh, the bulk of your, of your career, 40-plus years, at the same radio station? I was very lucky because, um, you know, they were very competitive, as we all were. You know, uh, CKWX uh, was very competitive along with CFUN and uh, CJOR. We had uh, competitive talk shows. We had competitive newscasts. So uh, it was a a great time to be part of radio. Now I happen to be with CKNW. I like the people I worked for, and um, I think we had a pretty good operation going for a long time. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, CKMO and CKWX in those early days. Uh, overall, w- what station do you think uh, gave you the most run for your money? Uh, I think at times it was um, uh, WX, especially when you went into the, uh, the all-news the all format. Uh, we were a bit concerned about that. And at times, uh, the competition in news... Uh, didn't come so much from other stations as uh, the competition came from talk show people like Pat Burns on CJOR. That gave NW a, a real scare. And Webster later on CJOR. So I guess the, the things we were watching for was talk shows, but even Brian Forrest, our great morning man, has said that CKNW's strength was its newsroom. He said that's why people tuned in. I think there's some uh, some truth in that. We had a really good operation uh, headed by Warren Barker and John McKittrick and a lot of very fine people uh, who have since gone on to other stations, and, and some like Terry Shintz are still there. Now, uh, you may well remember this. In 1957, WX and NW swapped frequencies. Uh, do you remember what was behind this move? Because <laughs> well, we... <laughs> uh, so, some say that WX never recovered, uh, and NW cemented its top dog position by being lower on the dial. Well, I remember that we, we were 1320 on the dial. We were trying very hard to get, I think, what they call it a clear channel. Uh, we wanted to be lower down on the dial, and we wound up at 980. And all I remember is there was quite a battle with WX over who got what frequency. But, you know, 1130 is pretty good, too, really. 
Now, as, as someone on the other side of the fence, uh, what were your impressions when uh, when WX went uh, from country to all news in, in 1996? I thought it was good for news, even though it was competition for us. I thought it's um, a service to the public. And I must say that over the 20 years, I've listened quite a bit, you know, in and out, in and out. And I'm amazed at how you do it. I know you have a lot of people working in the newsroom, but I don't hear too many goofs. Um, we used to have them at NW. <laughs> I guess every station has them. But your machine re- runs so well, and you go from, from one uh, feature to another seamlessly it's most of the time. So I think it's a, it's an uh, you know an important thing for the market to have that and to have it. To, I think it's twenty years now, isn't it? Uh, twenty three as of February eighth. Wow, that's that's quite a record. Now, um, uh, enough WX questions, I promise. <laughs> uh, what was your first big scoop, or what would you say was that uh, that career making story for you that? Uh, or, or did you more build? Do you think you built your reputation more over time and with a consistent body of work? Well, I built um, a trust with the, the police, which helped a lot. Excuse my frog in my throat. <clears> throat> um, I built the trust with the police. It helped a lot when stories like the Olson murders came along. That's probably one of the bigger stories that I've covered because I did have a, a tip uh, early on when the Olson was still at large, and there was a lot of concern. I had approval from my boss, Warren Barker, to say that it might be a serial killing. I had some advice from veteran police that I knew that it sounded like a serial killer, and I knew it would cause a lot of uh, consternation in the community, a lot of alarm. But at the same time, I thought we had an obligation to let the community know that there could indeed be uh, a serial killer operating, and then there was. So we ran that, and uh, that caused a lot of uh, news magazines, um, television networks, and so on, to attend news conferences that the RCMP were calling every day. And on the third day, I think it was, I noticed there was something different about the the, the body language of the superintendent, Bruce Northrup. I knew him very well, and the way he answered a question made me think he's holding something back. So I ran back to listen to the tape again to see what the question was. And the question was, could the killer still be in this area? And Bruce's response led me to think that there's something up. So I phoned my contact and I said, what's up, another body or an arrest? And he said, an arrest this morning on Vancouver Island. So I, I called Bruce Northrup again, the superintendent, who wouldn't quite confirm it, but I knew that We were on the right track, so I ran it, and it turned out to be correct. And there was one other element to that story, and that was I did get a tip that the RCMP were paying Olson $10,000 to find bodies, which is uh, anathema to any police officer. And they really disliked Olson, you know, because he was smoking cigars and giving his lawyer uh, instructions about how he wanted it done and so on. So I held that story. But I verified it by phoning the prosecutor at home, John Hall, now uh, an appeal court judge, or he was, and uh, I asked him about the $10,000. And all he said was, George, I think I'd put that on the back burner for now, which means don't use it. So we kept it. And until the Olson guilty plea came, and John Hall walked by my desk in the courthouse, and he said, you can take that matter off the back burner now, meaning you could use it. So that's a, an incident, I think, where trust really worked. And I would consider that one of my uh, better stories. Now, was there a, a favorite interview you've had? Um, well, I had an incident down in Los Angeles. It uh, wasn't an interview. <laughs> I started out uh, doing a report on for the Bill Good Show in the noon hour. And I was approached by four guys uh, who wanted the keys to my rental car, and I wouldn't give them up. So they grabbed the phone and hung it up and grabbed my microphone and ripped it out of his cord. And then they um, forced me into a doorway and smacked me in the in the, the nose and they broke my jaw. So that was quite an experience. And uh, uh, that's one I'll remember for a long time. And this is, uh, this is during the riots in 1992? That was Rodney King riots yes. in 92. And then I wanted to go back three years later for the 
the verdict in the O.J. Simpson case, and my then boss was uh, Gordon McDonald, <clears throat> and he said, you're not going because it's too dangerous. <laughs> but I already had uh, my flight booked, and I had uh, the arrangement to have a bulletproof vest from the Vancouver Police Department as a loan, and I was ready to go. And he said, you're not going. And then I found out that BCTV, as it then was, was going down. So I said, I'll go with them, and I'll be safe. He said, as long as you give me your word that you won't uh, abandon them, you have to stick with them all the time. But when I got down there, I ditched them, of course, <laughs> and went to do interviews. So <laughs> it works out okay, though. Now, my next question was going to be, what was your, your toughest or least favorite interview? But I think you've kind of covered that off <laughs> with the riots. <laughs> yeah, um, um, as far as interview is concerned, um, a very touching interview was with uh, a man named Chris Simmons, whose daughter had just been murdered that day in Surrey. And I didn't know the name of the victim. I knew it was a young lady. And out of the blue, I got a call from her uncle. And uh, he said, my brother, who is the father of the murder victim, will talk to you. So I went to his house and did an interview with him. And he was so marvelous to be able to talk about his loss and uh, what it meant to the family, he and his wife, Sue. And he told me some other information, but not all the information. He held back some that he gave only to the RCMP, and that was that his daughter had filed a complaint against the doctor alleging that she had been touched improperly. And in turn, the doctor hired a hitman to kill her so that he wouldn't have to face the College of Physicians and Surgeons. It just seems like a bizarre story, but it was true. Now, uh, the book isn't just about your professional life. You also delve uh, quite a bit into, into the personal. Many folks may not be aware that uh, you lost a son just as he was starting a radio career of his own. Uh, c can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. My son, Ken, was uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, followed my footsteps in the sense that he went to BCIT and uh, graduated from there. He was hired for a radio station up in uh, Fort St. John. Uh, hired as an announcer, then he became a salesman, and the owner, Gene Daniel, really liked Ken, and he promoted him to manager of that station and a satellite station further north in Fort Nelson, and uh, he was doing very well. He was 24 years old, and uh, he and his girlfriend were living in Fort St. John, and they decided uh, to go for a celebration of their engagement in early May in 1987, and the canoe overturned. And although they were wearing life jackets, um, uh, Ken died because he had hypothermia. He kept pushing Shelley, his girlfriend, up on the overturned canoe and saved her life, but uh, he died because of hypothermia. Very sad day in my life. Um, for those who have followed your career, uh, George, and you mentioned this earlier, one of your hallmarks is your uh, your myriad of contacts, your huge contact <laughs> book. Uh, how did you come to develop uh, those sources? I think it just happened over time because I started working the four to midnight shift uh, at the police station. You know, a lot of media people say, "Oh, the the cop shop beat is at the bottom of the of the ladder." I never thought that, and I I made friends with a lot of policemen. And over the years, I've got a lot of contacts. And then I followed politicians right from the time they were on school board or park board, city council, and up into uh, provincial and federal. Got to know them, and I would get their numbers just as a matter of course in dealing with them. And I kept them in what was called a Casio, an electronic thing. And uh, I could dial up a lot of numbers. And I would get calls once in a while from somebody in the media, and they say, do you have uh, Bill Bennett's home number in Kelowna? I said, yes, I do. Could I have it? No, you may not. <laughs> and I would only give them out uh, if it was really an important for somebody that I thought I should do a favor for. Now, uh, speaking of favors, you have the reputation of being a, a gentleman reporter, not just by the people you've interviewed, but by your, your fellow uh, newsmen and, and women. Uh, how did you come to uh, come up with that philosophy of, of sharing tape and extending other courtesies in, in what, as you've said, uh, as was especially back then a very cutthroat business? I think it's because I got burned myself by not preparing properly. I was pretty young, very uh, new to CKNW. And I was assigned to interview Field Marshal Montgomery, 
among other reporters. It was a, a, an interview of, of a lot of reporters. But it was out at the uh, Lieutenant Governor's House at the University of BC, and I was new to the area, and I got the wrong directions. I wound up so late that I uh, missed the whole news conference. I just heard the English voice of uh, Field, Marshal, uh, Field, Mont, uh, Field Marshal Mike Nimmer saying, thank you, gentlemen, and goodbye. So I knew I'd missed it all. And if I'd known the reporters then, I would have asked for some tape, and uh, I would have got it, but I didn't know anyone then. So I vowed that if I ever got in a situation where I had lots of tape and uh, everybody else is going to get the same thing, if somebody's late, uh, why not help them out and give them a, give them a clip of your tape? Uh, the listener wouldn't know the difference, really, where the tape came from. So sometimes that worked, and sometimes I got help from others, too. Now you also uh, the book also shows a bit of uh, your 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 mischievous side or your, your mischievous streak if you want to pardon the pun I think you're gonna know I think you know what's coming next here uh, tell me about the time you interviewed members of a nudist camp in Surrey well I took my poor wife Joan out for a drive and uh, I didn't tell her that I'd already arranged with the photographer Don LeBlanc to be there uh, to take uh, discreet pictures. And I had made an arrangement to do an interview in the nudist camp. And uh, as I arrived, I said, oh, by the way, Joan, uh, I just have to go into a nudist camp here for a few minutes. Would you like to come in? And she said no. And she sat in the car. She was not very happy. Uh, and one of the conditions of doing the interview was that I had to strip. But the person said, you could leave your shirt on as long as you undo the buttons. So I did that, went in, did the interview. Uh, with uh, several people and uh, had the picture taken with a little girl on my knee, very discreet and uh, certainly in good taste. And then uh, we left with Joan being very unhappy with me, <laughs> but that wasn't the first time. But uh, we sent the, took the interview to Jack uh, Kyle, a great disc jockey, and I told him ahead of time that I would have a nudist camp interview. So he decided on the music that he would play underneath the interview. It was instrumental. And the words were, you ought to be in pictures. You're so beautiful to see. Nice. Um, <laughs> you've been uh, you've been retired now for, for 20 years. In fact, you're, for anyone who wants to see it, it's on YouTube, your, your last scoop uh, of Gordon Wilson crossing the floor into uh, the NDP cabinet. Uh, yet you still have plenty to teach the rest of us about the craft. What is your opinion on the state of journalism today? I think it's a tougher uh, time for, for reporters now than when I worked. Uh, for one thing, as I understand it, uh, radio reporters have to do the radio uh, piece, the, the audio, and then they have to do a website presentation, which includes video, either still photos or, or uh, moving video. Uh, that's an extra burden for the reporter. So I think the job has become a lot more complicated. I know now there are video journalists, which I could never have done. And uh, the overall state of journalism, I think, is pretty good. Uh, uh, journalists are facing a lot of challenges, and I think they meet them. You know, the coverage is really good in Canada and the United States. Um, in the States, they're fighting off the, the uh, Donald Trump view of fake media. And, of course, there's the terrible media that is called media going on um, social websites, not professionally done and uh, not censored at all, not, not properly managed. So I think there are many, many, many factors that reporters are dealing with. And the most serious one of all is the danger that reporters face. I believe there are 1,170-some journalists who've been killed in the last 27 years. When I read that stat, I was totally shocked. And more and more, I think, are being killed all the time or some are put in jail. So it's a dangerous profession, and uh, there are a lot of people that are doing it well. But yet if somebody asked me, um, should I try to go into journalism? I would say absolutely. It's the best job in the world. Now, having said all that, uh, George, do you miss it at all? Are there stories out there you, you wish you could <laughs> sink your teeth into now? I love the one in Victoria. I'd love to have a few pieces of that story, you know, of uh, what those two top officials are accused of doing. Um, I just can't believe that, that you know, that was going on. And uh, that's one story I'd like to have had or be a part of. But if I were to, to try to do the job now that I did many years ago, it would be pretty difficult. 
Because if you look at um, Kim Bolin, who's Vancouver's son, I think the best crime reporter we've ever had in this market, she has so many contacts, it would be um, impossible to to match her. She did tell me, in fact, when she was a, a kid on the beat or on the desk years ago, that the desk would say, uh, they listen to CKNW, and they'd say, Garrett's got this, can you match it? And I love to hear that. And um, so, uh, like we mentioned, you've been retired now for some time, but you still keep busy. Uh, uh, from time to time, we get to talk to you about uh, the volunteer cancer drivers. How did that yes. come about? Uh, that's because uh, I had been a cancer driver for the Canadian Cancer Society uh, uh, when, before my wife came down with Alzheimer's, which was in 2010. So I discontinued driving for them. And in 2014, or 15 rather, they decided they would discontinue the whole service. And two of the fellows that I drove with, uh, Garth Pinton and uh, the late John McInnes, decided they would start their own organization to help the cancer patients who were frantic about how they would go to treatment. So um, they did start the volunteer cancer drivers. They called me in because of my media contacts, and uh, we got going. And I'm now the vice president in charge of... uh, fundraising, and I do quite a bit of media contact as well. All right. Uh, I think that about does it for me, uh, George. Uh, <clears throat> we we, we uh, very quickly rolled 22 minutes of just uh, just us chatting, but uh, I want to say thank you so much for, for doing this, and thank you for, for putting uh, your story down on paper for, uh, for many reporters uh, years from now to enjoy as well.